I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you haven't done so already, to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, um, it gives us wisdom to live well in a confusing world. God created the world in wisdom, and when we walk according to God's wisdom, it's like we're going with the grain of things. We're doing what we ought to. So wisdom teaches us to do the right thing, and it keeps us from doing the wrong thing, but it does, it does more. It also teaches us to do the right thing in the best way possible. So, for example, helping the poor is a good thing, right? That's right. That's moral. That's upright. We ought to be doing that. But are there wiser ways and more foolish ways to go about doing that? Of course, right? Yeah, we might do more harm than good if we help in the wrong way. So we need wisdom to live in this increasingly complex and confusing world. Today I want to focus on wisdom concerning our spirit. The word spirit in the Old Testament is kind of slippery and nuanced. It's part of a family of words. It's uh, connected to the word for heart and the word for soul, but it's not quite the same thing. The word literally means wind or breath. Usually it's accompanied with the related ideas of some kind of force or some kind of energy. So when the word spirit is used to describe the human spirit, it's roughly analogous to one's inner life. The passion, the zeal we have for life, the fervor, the energy uh, of life, what animates us, what keeps us going, our breath. So the health of our inner life, the health of our spirit, is very important because it's easy for that spirit to become wounded or even crushed. So the Proverbs help us understand the inner life of the spirit and how to heal it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So four uh, basic points today. And the first one is the priority of the inner life. The priority of the inner life. Look at Proverbs 18 and verse 14. It says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? Now we talk about the, the, the meat of the word and the milk of the word. Well, the Proverbs are a little bit like the hard candy. You have to uh, take your time. You can't just bite them and swallow them. You're liable to hurt yourself. So when we read through these Proverbs, just take a moment. A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? Now, a crushed spirit, I think we know what that means, right? The, the, the discouragement, the loss of desire for life. When we, when we lose our purpose, we lose our hope. Now, there are degrees to a wounded or a crushed spirit, from general discouragement to deep depression. What is this proverb teaching us? Well, a crushed or broken body, sickness, can be sustained by a strong and healthy spirit. But the opposite is not true. A crushed and broken spirit can never be sustained by a strong and healthy body. So the truth of the proverb, it goes deeper than just physical sickness and health. Even if all of your outward things in life are in order, your health is in order, your finances are in order, you went to the right college, you got the right degree, you've got the best career, You've got two and a half kids in a two-car garage and all this other stuff. You can still be broken and crushed inside, you see. So what's the application? Well, instead of trying to manufacture our happiness and our fulfillment by perpetually trying to manufacture pleasant circumstances, focusing on the outside all the time, we need to be addressing the inward man, the inward woman. We need to be addressing that spirit first. And really, when you think about it, this reflects a lot of the prayers that the Apostle Paul were, was praying for the first century churches, right? Now, a lot of those churches were dealing with really terrible physical struggles, things like persecution, people being put in jail. But you don't see Paul praying that God would relieve them of their physical ailments, their physical problems, more often you see stuff like this. Ephesians 3, verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit, where? 
in your inner being. So if our circumstances are bad, but our spirit is strong in the Lord, you can endure. In contrast, if our circumstances are good, but our spirit is weak and crushed, well, the proverb says, who can bear it? Do you see the priority of the inner life? If you're not more concerned with depositing God's grace and God's truth and God's love in your spirit than you are with depositing money in your 401k, you're a fool. You need wisdom. The wise understand the priority of the inner life. The second thing is, you know, what, what crushes the spirit? How does, and how does a crushed spirit affect our lives? And the, the Bible's answer is that it's pretty complicated. Our, our spirit, our inner life is connected to many other factors. So here's a couple, just bullet points here. There's a physical, there's a medical dimension to this. Now, if you would turn over to Proverbs 14 and verse 30, let's read together. Chapter 14 and verse 30. Listen to what this proverb says. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Do you see the inside and the outside? You see that there? Let's read it again. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. When the heart, when the inside is healthy, when it's tranquil, it's calm, it's sound, it revives the flesh, the body. But when there's envy, and envy, your version might say something different like zeal or passion or jealousy or something. These are hot emotions like anger, not negative or positive. But when you're ruled by those things on the inside, it can make your bones rot. So your emotional state, the health of your inner person can affect your physical and medical health. We know that. We know that, right? Doctors are just now telling us that this is so, but here's ancient wisdom. Here's another one, 17, chapter, tw chapter 17, verse 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Sometimes you need a laugh. You need a joke instead of a pill, right? So there's a physical dimension to this. There's also an emotional or and a, a relational dimension to this. Chapter 12, verse 25. 12, 25. It says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. So when anxious fear pulls us down into sadness, into depression, a good word, a kind and encouraging and insightful word, it can make you glad. We've all been there, right? It helps us regain a proper perspective on life. It renews our confidence. It renews our spirit. Chapter 16, 24. Chapter 16, verse 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. So an outside encouragement, a word of encouragement coming from a friend, that can positively affect your inner life, which then affects your outer life as well. There's a moral uh, and ethical dimension to this as well. Chapter 28, verse 1. Chapter 28 and verse 1. It says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. This is actually a, kind of a quotation from Leviticus, but he's contrasting what a wicked person does between, uh, with what a, uh, what a uh, righteous person does. Righteous people, because their inner life, their spirit is right with God, well, they can go out and face real danger with the boldness of a lion, with the courage of a lion, while wicked people, because their spirit isn't right with God, they run away even when there's no danger, right? Because of their guilt, they're insecure. 
They, they flee because they have a guilty conscience or because they're suspicious of everyone or they, they're, they're, they're fearful that they're going to come into judgment. They're always looking over their shoulder even when there's nothing to be worried about. So you see how the inside affects the outside, the behavior. There's another philosophical or existential dimension to this inner life. Chapter 14 and verse 13. Chapter 14 and verse 13. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. So living east of Eden, under the sun, no joy that we experience is completely free of grief. There's this underlying pain that's still there after the joke ends, after the party is over. Now, the translators have softened this. My version says the heart may ache, the, joy, uh, the end of joy may be grief. That may isn't there in any of the Hebrew manuscripts. They added that, okay? So what it really says is even in laughter, the heart aches. And the end of joy is grief. There's no may about it. That's just a fact of life. If you live long enough, if you live long enough, the things that we derive joy from are your career, your relationships, your health, your freedom of movement. These things will slowly be taken away, one at a time, if we live long enough, right? We, we might not want to think about that, but that's true. Now look at this from the perspective of someone who doesn't have God in their lives. How can people who believe they were not created and that death is the end, in other words, their origin is insignificant and their destiny is insignificant, how can they derive any joy and significance with the part in between? So this underlying grief of the spirit has existential philosophical dimensions. The fact of human loss, the fact of sorrow, they, they force us to search for some kind of meaning beyond ourselves. I think this is getting at what Solomon said in another book when he said that God makes everything beautiful in his time. He set eternity into the heart of man yet so that he cannot discern it. There's got to be something more. There's got to be something better. Which leads us to the fifth dimension here, the faith dimension, the spiritual dimension. Chapter 15 and verse 13. Chapter 15, verse 13. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is crushed. Now, the heart and the spirit, as we noted before, they're not exactly the same thing. The spirit has to do with the inner passion, the zeal for life. Heart has to do with our affections, our loyalties. It's the mind or the will. It's where our emotions, where our passions actually come from. Therefore, the proverb is contrasting a joyful heart with a painful heart. The joyful heart lifts our spirit. It invigorates our inner life. It makes us cheerful, gives us gladness, whereas a painful heart has the opposite effect, crushes our spirit. Therefore, our heart is, needs to be set on the right things, right? If our heart is set on the right things, then our, our zeal, our passion, our spirit will follow suit. So you have a proverb like this, chapter 13 and verse 12. Chapter 13 and verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So when your heart is set on something and you are longing for that thing with the deepest part of your inner being and you don't get it, well, heartache, right? Your heart becomes sick and your spirit is crushed and who can bear it? But if we do get it, the deepest longing of your human heart, if you really do get it, what is it? Proverbs says it's a tree of life. So the real question is, what is your ultimate hope? What is your heart really set on? Because you've got to be real careful 
about what you set your ultimate hope in. Because your spirit hangs in the balance. If you set your hope and your heart on anything less than God, anything that's contingent, anything that's temporary, anything that can fade away or be corrupted, if any, even your relationships with your family, if you set your hope on those things, you're bound to be disappointed. Your hope will be deferred. Your heart will be sick and your spirit will be crushed. But what if there was something we could set our heart on that would truly satisfy us? Something that is, in fact, guaranteed to satisfy us. All the hope, all the longing in our inner being would be fulfilled. It would result in that tree of life. What if there was something out there that could do that for you? And, of course, that's your relationship with God. That's what ties all this together. Without number five, right? what, what else is there? You know, if, if you've got number five here, if you've got the spiritual dimension and you set your hope on God and that connection between you and God is restored through Jesus and it's healthy, then, well, the, physic, the, the philosophical, the existential question of grief, you've got an answer for that one. Uh, your, your, uh, your moral, your ethical questions, well, those are answered. Your relational uh, your relationships and how you treat other people and, and, and those kind words that are coming in and you're sending them out, that's answered. And then even, we could even say the physical, right? Now, of course, we all get sick, right? We're going to die. It's the end of all man. But after this comes the judgment. But in the resurrection, there's an answer for that too. So, you know, all the world's answers to all of these inner life, kind of these psychological kind of questions, Aren't they so simplistic? They only address maybe one or two of these things. But look at Proverbs. This is 3,000. We are reading stuff that's 3,000 years old. And it gives us this full body of wisdom about the inner life. Do we understand what we have? More precious than gold? So the wise understand the priority and the complexity of the inner life. Very quickly here, number three Let's talk about the solitude of the inner life. This is a tough one, not to understand, but to swallow. But I think we know that it's true. Proverbs 14 and verse 10. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. In other words, there are some joys and some sorrows that you experience that you just can't really share with other people. And even, not just the stranger, but even your closest, most intimate friend can't truly understand your deepest feelings. People think they understand you. They think they have you figured out. They think they can relate to you, and maybe on some level they can, right? But not at the deepest level. So there's this unavoidable solitude to our lives. We're always going to feel a little disjointed. We're always going to feel a little awkward, a little out of place. That's what the proverb is saying. That's the way it is. We, we need to understand Genesis 3. We're living in exile. Things are not the way they ought to be right now. And even our relationships, when we explain our thoughts and our feelings in the clearest way that we can with our vocabulary, there's always going to be some kind of barrier of understanding between people. Let's add a second part to this. Proverbs 16 and verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. This one's even more fundamental. Sometimes... We don't even know ourselves, right? We may think we're doing the right thing, but we really just convinced ourselves, and we're justifying ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? The proverb says, the Lord weighs the spirit. Only God really sees us as we truly are, and that's the point we're making today. There's no one on earth who understands you. I mean, to your deepest you know, bottom. 
So there will always be something missing in our earthly, earthly relationships. But God truly knows us through and through. He truly knows you from top to bottom, from inside out. So while there's solitude in the inner life, you don't have to be lonely. You can understand that God knows who you are. He sees and he knows and he understands. And this ought to draw us closer to him. Let's make one final point here. So wise people understand the priority of the inner life as opposed to the outer, the complexity of the inner life and the solitude of the inner life. Well, how do we go about healing that inner life? We've already hinted at this, actually, in chapter 13. Remember when we saw the phrase, the tree of life? Do you remember that? Tree of life. What does that make you think of? That phrase, the tree of life, I just found this out this week. I, don't know, I can't believe I missed this for this long. The tree of life is that, if you type that in with under quotation marks, tree of life, in your Bible app or whatever, you will only see that phrase in three books in the Bible. And we know Genesis and Revelation and right here in the middle in Proverbs. Hmm. Interesting, right? The only overt references to the tree of life other than the first book and the last book is in Proverbs. It's only four times in the book. Let's think about that for a minute. I think that's significant. First of all, in Genesis, it tells that humanity's access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden was forfeited through sin. So the tree of life, if you go back there in Genesis 3, the tree of life was in the middle of the Garden of Eden. And it, its fruit gave, gave life, not just everlasting life, right? S speaking in the temporal way, that life that would last forever, it did that, but also fullness of life, abundant life, a qualitative kind of uh, greatness there. The absolute satisfaction of our God-given pure desires, your desire for food, your desire for, for, for relationship and activity and creativity and security and love, all of that was there in the garden. But we lost access to the tree of life through sin. So when you read the last paragraph of Genesis 3, 22 to 24, it tells the story. After Adam and Eve had sinned, they'd been tempted by the devil. They sinned. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life eat and eat and live forever, and he just leaves that, <laughs> leaves that thought go. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The idea is that they can't find their way back now to that tree of life. So Adam and Eve's story in Genesis, do we not see their story mirrored in my life and in your life as well, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all failed the test, haven't we? When we choose to be our own masters, when we foolishly rebel against God's authority and we do what's right in our own eyes without reference to God. Remember what the proverb said? And here we are living in this brokenness now, living in, you know, th this world of our own making. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But what is desire fulfilled? A tree of life. So that awareness that we all have, that disjointed loneliness, something's wrong, that underlying grief just beyond our laughter and our inner being, that deep longing, that hope within us that goes deferred, what is that desire other than the desire for God and the tree of life, to get back to that ideal, to get back to perfection, to get back to the garden. We instinctively know this. Our inner lives are broken. The world around us is broken. We feel out of place. We're in a state of exile. We long for the tree of life. We long for the perfection of Eden. It's like we have a sense of cosmic nostalgia, a longing for something that we remember yet we've never had. God said eternity in your heart. That's why you feel that way. The Bible has an answer for that. 
C.S. Lewis said, I forget which book it was, but he said, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. That's what Ecclesiastes is pursuing. We long to be on the inside of some door which we've always seen from the outside. So we've got Genesis. Our access to the tree of life has been barred. But then you've got Revelation. Humanity's access to the tree of life is now restored through Christ. We'll come to Revelation in a minute, but there aren't any overt references tree of life outside of these three books, Genesis, Proverbs, Revelation, but there are many references, right, to the tree of life. In the New Testament, have you ever noticed, as you're reading the, the, the letters of Paul or maybe Peter's sermons or something like that, have you ever noticed that Peter and Paul describe Jesus' death as being hanged on what? A tree. Why? I, I remember reading that for the first time years ago when I became a Christian and being like, well, that's kind of a stretch, isn't it, Paul? A tree, I mean, yeah, you could say that the wood from the cross came from a tree, but wouldn't cross be more appropriate? Well, I was missing the point. He did that on purpose, right? I think he's trying to draw our minds back to that significant tree. He has a couple of trees, the tree of life, and that there's also a tree of curse, cursing. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. Look at what Paul says to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, it says in verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You want to be right with God on the basis of your own life and your own you know, obedience and perfection? If you don't do every one of those commandments, then you're under sin. You're cursed. What did Jesus do? Skip down to verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So Jesus took the curse we deserve because of our sin, because of our failure to live according to God's law. He took that upon himself. And the cross, a tree of death, a tree of curse, became to us a tree of life because it's through his death he died on that tree that we live. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. We are healed. That cosmic nostalgia, that deepest longing of the human heart to be healed, to be put right, to live abundantly in peace and joy and goodness with God can only be satisfied in Jesus. Why? Why did God tell Moses on the inside of the tabernacle, make sure there's lots of palm trees and stuff? Why? Why the cherubim? on the Ark of the Covenant? Why the east-facing door? Why, when Jesus died on the tree, did the temple tear in two? Was He not opening through the veil of His flesh a new and living way back to the tree of life to be reconciled to our Creator? O oh, all ye who pass by, behold and see, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree, the tree of life to all, but only me. Was ever grief like mine? When John, now we're in Revelation 22, when John is shown a vision, the new heavens, new earth, the new Jerusalem, what does he see? Well, we know. A garden-like city. Revelation 22, verse 1 and 2. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city and also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It's the place where wounded and crushed spirits are healed. Not automatically, 
not to every single human being, but by faith to those who come to him on his terms. Skip down to verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates. The only way to wash our robes, to make our lives white as snow, is through the cleansing blood of Christ. In the meantime, what's going to get us to that tree of life? It's God's wisdom. It's God's word. His wisdom through his word. You know, Job pointed out in that great chapter on wisdom, Job chapter 28, no matter how deep we dig for it, true wisdom cannot be found by human beings unaided. If human beings want real wisdom, they've got to go to God. And God gives it to us. Back to that passage that Adam read, Proverbs 3, verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She's more pre precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her, are fast, hold her fast are called blessed. And nowhere is God's wisdom more plainly given to us and revealed than in Jesus Christ. Paul says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He says in another place, 1 Corinthians 1, Christ is the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. So when we ho lay hold of God's wisdom in Christ, it becomes a tree of life to us. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. When we bring Christ, our broken inner lives, so marred by sin, he will create anew and make whole again. And we do that initially through repentance, faith, confession, and baptism, having our lives cleansed, having our robes, in the language of Revelation, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, made pure, made clean, so that we can have a right to that tree of life. But you know what? We've got to go on every day, living out that baptism, living by faith, living in repentance, if we're going to live wise, faithful, joyful, God-glorifying lives. If you need the grace of God that's abundantly available in Jesus Christ today, whether you're outside of Christ and you've never been baptized and you'd like that healing that, he can on, that only he can give you, or if you need the prayers of this church, and come forward as we stand and sing and let your need be known.